thought it'd be interesting to, to sort of step away from your keynote slightly and look a bit more at some of your recent work and um, and in particular your your book uh, How Learning Happens, which I guess has become I don't know something of a something of an instant classic, um, which for people who don't know uh, is a sort of summary of really key important pieces of um, education research over the past um, well. 60 years. 60 years. Um, I think the oldest is from 1960 to 1963. And so that makes it about um, 60 years old, the oldest piece of of, of research that we, that Carl and I discussed. Okay, great. So bearing in mind sort of the current climate and um, the things educators have gone through in the last 12 months, what sort of New light has that shed on particular pieces of research, and perhaps you know, having really focused on you know remote learning and this this type of interaction with learners, what how's that sort of recontextualized it for you? Um, well, from what I gather from following things like Twitter, Facebook, blogs, and things like that, uh, because I'm an emeritus professor, which means supposedly I'm retired. Um, although my wife um, kind of has the idea that I'm working more now than I did when I wasn't retired. Um, uh, I think it's shown a light on the necessity of, of good, explicit, direct instruction. That kids at school aren't capable of self-regulating their own learning. Um, that when they try to discover things, they get lost. In normal in-school education, this lack of ability to self-regulate one's own learning uh, is in itself a problem. Um, kids don't start studying at the right time, uh, 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 don't do the homework at, at the right time, uh, don't get their projects done on time, and that's in a normal, that's called in-class uh, situation. But this in, inability in an, in an online situation is actually very deadly for learning. So I, I see a lot of teachers who are um, kind of getting away from the so-called uh, progressive approaches and realizing that students really do need a lot of, of, of good direct instruction, uh, need a lot of coaching, need a lot of support, um, need you to help them to do the things that they're supposed to do or they need to do when they need to do it. And that's only made it more salient, this inability, because you often don't see it if you're there in the classroom, because all of these little cues and things that you do uh, put them on the right track, and you have the idea maybe that they can do it themselves, but they can't. And in this online situation, um, they can't. So if you ask me um, which chapters maybe are the most relevant from the last year, uh, I'd say, well, um, chapter two on cognitive load theory, um, on how important it is to minimize the load on one's working memory, uh, especially when they're alone and um, they have no actual help when they need it. Uh, chapter seven on why independent learning is it a good way to become an independent learner? And I think all of part four of the book on why, uh, on, on, on things like elaboration theory, beginning broad and zooming in, um, why discovery learning is a poor instructional strategy, on direct instruction, on the role of assessment or retrieval practice for learning, on how to give good feedback, feed up, feed through, and feedback, and um, about learning techniques that really work, like uh, retrieval practice, space practice, uh, interleaving, those types of things. I think um, those chapters are much more, uh, are, are as important or if not more important in the situation that we're in now than they were in the normal face-to-face -face setting. That's interesting. You 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 bring up uh, direct instruction there straight away. I think that's one of the sort of uh, techniques, I guess, that's that's 
been focused on a lot during the last 12 months. Have you seen the um, the sort of skills honed by teachers working digitally? How, how have they adapted their practice? Or what's worked? Well, I, I, I think um, from, from what I've, I've seen, yeah, is that more and more teachers are coming to the conclusion that explicit instruction isn't a regressive approach to instruction, only propagated by dinosaurs and uh, people who hate children, um, but have seen that it actually works and that it's efficient and effective. And the kids themselves, and I see that here in the Netherlands, but I also see it online in, in the UK, the kids themselves are screaming for, we want more structure, we want more guidance, we want, we, 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 we're tired of doing it ourselves and alone and, 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 and trying to figure it out ourselves. And um, that whole idea of kids don't want explicit instruction because it kills the soul. If you know what explicit instruction is, it's a very varied approach to teaching and learning. And it's very successful. And that motivates you if you've done something and you see that you've learned it, that you're further than you were when you started, that motivates to, to, to more learning as opposed to the ineffective progressive approaches, which the kids and the parents are saying, like, give my kid good instruction. That's what they need. Stop with this discovery, inquiry, uh, trying to figure it out themselves. Teach them. Yeah, please teach them. And the kids are saying that also themselves. And so I see that... Uh, that's becoming more acceptable. Yeah? People say, uh, are we going now to online learning because now teachers have done it? I think it's become more acceptable to think that explicit instruction is good instruction uh, and there's not a dirty word. And what I also see is that teachers in schools aren't able, because they don't have the resources and the skills, to make good online learning. Yeah? The best that they can do is what I call emergency remote teaching. Yeah? They're keeping the patient alive, which is quite different from good online learning, in which I compare that often to a, a, an academic hospital, in which there are teams of surgeons and, 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 and healthcare workers and uh, nurses and anesthetists and all of the apparatus that you need. That's good online learning. And what we're now in is kind of like a mobile arm or army surgical hospital in a war zone or in a, um, uh, where there's been a, a, what's the word? Uh, a catastrophe, an earthquake or, or, or a typhoon or something like that that's gone across an island. And all we're doing is keeping the learner alive and helping them not lose what they've already learned and hopefully help them learn more. Teachers weren't taught to do that, so it's not the teacher's fault. Teachers weren't taught to make online. From one day, from, from, from Monday to Tuesday, they had to go over to a completely different mode of teaching, which they had never done before. The schools had to make use of commercial packages that aren't made for teaching and learning. Teams and Zoom are made for online meetings, not for teaching. They're not dedicated pieces of programs. And so it's not the teacher's fault. It's not the school's fault. It's COVID's fault. And teachers have done their darndest, their best to do what they can in a situation that they didn't learn about beforehand, that they had never done before with tools that they had never seen before. Do you think... Um off the back of this 12 months, we've said direct instruction will be perhaps seen in a new light. Um, do you think there will be other, you mentioned inquiry-based learning, do you think there will be other techniques that perhaps might be shown to be less effective or might fall away? Oh, yeah, a, 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 a lot of uh, unusable techniques, maybe too many to, 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 to mention. Um, uh, if we take a look at things like um, uh, simulation-based learning, yeah? if you don't understand the fundamentals behind the simulation, 
it's just trial and error. You spend quite a lot of time doing something. Maybe you make it work, but you don't learn from it. So there are all of these different techniques. Um, I think we'll see that um, uh, taking notes on, on online, which is primarily cutting and pasting, uh, works a lot worse than taking notes at school where you have to write things down, where you can't write as quickly as I can speak. So you have to summarize, paraphrase, and then you're processing information, which means you're learning from it. Whereas working in a digital environment, what you tend to do is to cut and paste from what you're reading or, or the notes, and you don't learn anything from that. I mean, then you're doing a simple manipulative uh, skill without thinking. So all of these types of things will probably show themselves to be less useful or that there are more useful things that you can do in a uh, 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 making use of effective, efficient, enjoyable things from 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 uh, uh, direct instruction. Explic I, some people use direct. I like to call it explicit instruction. Yeah? Not this implicit. Well, they'll learn if they're exposed to it. They will, in some magical way, understand the concepts and learn from it if you just expose them to things. Um, that's definitely not the case. Worth clarifying. Um, is there a worry that off the back of this, teaching might become a little bit more one-dimensional? We might see less kind of uh, progressive, explorative forms of teaching and, and teachers might have in the back of their mind another lockdown, another period of blended learning. They want to keep things simple. Is that a danger? Or is that something um, you I think don't think positive? so. Um, um, uh, explicit instruction or direct instruction isn't uh, one-dimensional. If I put up a slide now, I had it in it. Uh, Barrick Rosenshine, sometimes there are 10 in, in, in his American Federation of Teachers article. He had 10 in his uh, 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 UNESCO book. He had 17 different techniques that you can use. It's a melange. It's, it's, it's a very rich menu of things that you can do. It's not just giving a, um, uh, a lecture in the class and then giving homework. That's a, that, that's a straw man for it. So in itself, it's very rich and, 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 and multidimensional. Um, I, I, I like to compare it to something that Johan Cruyff once said, for you Brits, that's Johan Cruyff, uh, the best Dutch soccer player yesterday. He was he died five years ago yesterday. What he once said was, playing football is very simple, but playing simple football is the hardest thing that there is. This might be true for teaching. Explicit instruction, yeah? Um, teaching well is very, very simple. But simple teaching, using things like small steps, um, uh, 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 quizzes, um, uh, having students uh, refresh their prior knowledge before you begin on something new that they need that prior knowledge for. Those are all very simple things. And those are the things that we need to do. And that's very varied. There are 10, 15 different ways of making use of retrieval practice to make sure that it's what you've learned is brought out of your long-term memory into your working memory, that the prior knowledge is there when you need it. Um, there are, are incredible number of techniques that you can use that are all direct and explicit and that you can make use of it. The hardest thing is knowing what to use and when to use it. And that's where you see the difference between an ex expert teacher and an experienced teacher. That's that's a, a really good point. I think it ties nicely into the the idea of the the summit um, and the yeah. that focus on learning, and and also the fact that yeah, there probably has been a focus on these these techniques over the last twelve months, and perhaps we'll we'll see better teaching off the back. I of hope it. so. Um, I hope so. I hope that my book is also done a little bit because that's also, I see it often being used. Yes, yes. Um, and going back to your book, actually, in terms of the next 
12 months perhaps and uh, the UK I'm sure in in um, Holland as well there's been a lot of talk of catch up and these learning gaps and I think there's a feeling that te- teachers feel very sort of under pressure to close the gaps and assess uh, rigorously and quickly where would you direct people to um, in terms of research on that front? Oh that's a difficult one Um, I think my first piece of advice would be um, to only use evidence-informed approaches and not to lose time and effort uh, on things that have been shown either to not work or been shown to not be very efficient or effective. So if you're trying to close the gap in what they should have learned and what they've learned, choose the approaches that are most effective and efficient. That's the first piece of advice. The second piece of advice, and it's not the teachers, but it's more the government, uh, to rethink things like uh, doubling up and, 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 and stuff like that. You, you can't recoup a half a year loss in all of the subjects by hitting the accelerator on, 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 on the floor of the car and adding extra time after school and in weekends and in summer holiday. You can't make up for the 12 months. We have enough problem in September making up for the summer dip, which is normal, uh, in which we had a, a full year and they lose some of it during the, the, the summer holiday. That's hard enough in September. Um, let's try not to kill ourselves to make up what we've lost in a year, because that's what we're talking about with some kids. It's a one year of lost teaching and um, uh, uh, the government, Ofsted, have to realize that that's the case and soften up on, on, on things like, are you a bad school if children sit a year again? I think you're doing more for the kid to take away the stigma of sitting out a, sitting a year again if as schools, as parents, as government, um, you accept it. And um, I think finally, um, not to put all of our stress on the cognitive side, and it's hard, something strange from a cognitive scientist as I am, to say only on the cognitive side. A teacher and learning well-being are incredibly important at this moment. Keep that in mind as a part of the equation. And that goes back to what I just said about the government. Um, you're not dumb if you're doubling up a year because of what COVID has done. That's a normal thing. You've lost a lot of learning and let's get away of the stigma of that instead of trying to cram all of it, all of what was lost in two or three months. And I see, I know that governments and schools will be setting up summer schools and teachers working 12 months a year and kids getting almost no summer break to try to to make up for what was lost. And you just, can't do it. It does makes no matter how hard I try to drive, if I've wasted an hour in, in, in traffic, I'll never get there on time. Because then I have 15 minutes to go the last 120 miles, which means I should have to go 480 miles an hour to get there. And you just can't do that. And understand that, hey, we'll get there later. We'll get to that point again, but we'll get there later. But if we try to go 480 miles an hour, we're going to get into a car crash. Apart from the fact that my car won't go 480 miles an hour. (laughs) And kids can't go 480 miles an hour. And teachers can't go 480 miles an hour. And so you'll end up into an incredible car crash and collision. So don't even try it. It's up to the government and the schools to get rid of the stress that we have to make up for those 12 months in two months. Great stuff. Nice, nice point to finish on. Nice analogy there. Um, Paul, I know, I know we started a bit early, so um, I'll, I'll wrap up there. Thank you so much again for, for having a quick chat with me. That was really... My pleasure, Simon. It was great talking um, to you. It's great meeting you. Great. And yourself.